Hi, geography students. This is Mrs. Wildy. This is going to be our chapter two video lecture to review the chapter before a test. Um, again, your study guide should be out. Um, that way you can kind of jot down some notes from the video lecture as well as um, make some notes that you want to ask in class before the test. Um, this chapter, of course, deals with humans in terms of where they live and why they live there. Um, and the first question in terms of where they live is looking at population density. So that's a measurement of the number of people per square mile or square kilometer, just a measure of land. Um, and there are two main types of population density. There is arithmetic population density, which is taking the total population and dividing it by the total land. Um, it doesn't take into account exactly where people concentrate, none of that internal clustering, but it does give you a number and you can compare different countries based on it. A little more reliable way of looking at population density is physiologic population density. And this looks at or takes the number of people and divides it by the total amount of arable land, land that can be farmed on, which is typically where people live. Um, again, people tend to live where they can be comfortable and, and have a good livelihood. So places that are really, really cold or really, really hot or really, really wet or really, really dry are usually not good places to live. So you find more people concentrated in um, interior areas, typically around rivers um, or possibly the coast. Again, more temperate climates. So just remember that in terms of looking at population density for the world. Um, when you look at arithmetic versus physiologic, one of the countries that really stands out is Egypt because in terms of total land, it looks like there's very few people per square kilometer or square mile. But when you look at the physiologic, because 98% of Egypt is, is desert, it's much more reliable, but it's a much higher number because you're taking the population and, and dividing it by a very small period, you know, um, parcel of land, which is arable. So um, it's also, in reality, where most people live is along the Nile River. So it's a good way of looking at um, the differences between arithmetic and physiologic and seeing that you can have a low arithmetic and a high physiologic if you have a place that's mostly desert or mostly mountain. Um, because again, people are not going to be able to easily live in those places. If you look at a dot map, you can see the distribution of, of um, areas in the world. Um, again, I think that it's important to recognize that you're not going to find large clustering of, of dots near very, very cold places or very, very hot places like deserts, very, very um, dry places, don't find people, um, and also very, very wet where you might have flooding or more natural disasters that causes people to not uh, live there as well. Um, it is important to understand our four main areas of, of population in the world um, in order, East Asia, South Asia, Europe, and North America. Um, in East and South Asia, the majority of people live around rivers. That's where the city started. In Europe, you do have concentration around rivers, but you also have it near the coal deposits because that's where the Industrial Revolution really took off. And then in North America, again, it has to do with our resources around coal and um, um, natural gas, perhaps. But one of the main concepts of the chapter with North America is understanding the megalopolis. So this is where you have a concentration of several cities that are all have lots of population. And they kind of look like one big city, one mega city. So Boswash is the good example of that, which is the cities of Boston, Philadelphia, New York, Baltimore, and Washington, DC. Um, when you look at history in terms of why populations rise and fall, it's important to look at a, a graph of time period. And I also want to remind you of the heartbeat video that we watched where there was a very, very slow growth of population around the world um, from before, you know, 1 AD all the way until about 1750, 1800, with that Industrial Revolution is when you really start seeing a, a much higher increase in population. And it's never really stopped to the point that we're now at, at over 7 billion people. Um, the growth in the cities of developing countries has really skyrocketed in the last um, 50 years or so, 60 years. Um, and that's a, a, an important concept for um, understanding the complexities and, and co um, 
problems that you have with a large group of people living in urban areas. You may not have enough land or jobs. There may be more, more uh, crime, more clustering of, of um, certain groups into poorer conditions. Uh, air quality may be less. Water quality may be less. There may be more disease. All those things are significant when looking at it. Thomas Malthus was a demographer in Britain who was seeing the results of the Industrial Revolution and felt like we were going to run out of food. Um, he said that, you know, at, truly, population grows exponentially, but, pop, but food supply grows linearly. And at that point, we would run out of food. So he didn't realize that we'd have things like the Green Revolution and GMOs and pesticides and, you know, better technology for, for farming. Um, and he didn't have a, a clue about how colonization was going to lead to trade negotiations and globalization networks and all of that. So he was, he was wrong, um, but it's, he's, we still need to talk about him, and we still, there are still people called Neo-Malthusians. Um, Ehrlich would be considered one of them, but there are other people that feel like we're going to run out of resources, like clean air and water, before we run out of food. Um, we're going to run out of, of land in general to be able to use. Um, trees are being cut down in, in large numbers. So those things are going to go away before we run out of food. And those are still things to consider, especially when we look at carrying capacity. That's the maximum number of people an area can support in terms of, of the population with the resources and technology it needs. And if you have overpopulation, then you have sort of exhausted your, your carrying capacity. Um, at the rate we're doubling right now, the rate of natural increase, the doubling time for the world is around 50 years. I think it's 58 years. So my question for you would be, do you think we're going to reach carrying capacity at that point or before it? Is the, What is the carrying capacity of the earth in terms of us being able to take care of the majority of people on this planet? It's something to consider, certainly. Um, one of the cal calculations you'll need for this test is the rate of natural increase. And it's a fairly easy calculation. It's, it's literally the crude birth rate minus the crude death rate divided by 10. And that's a percent. So it doesn't take into consideration immigration into or out of the country. It's just births minus deaths. Um, but it gives you a good idea of how fast a country or a region of the world is increasing. You can also look at statistics like total fertility rate. This is an average number of children born to a woman within her lifetime. Um, and again, areas that with very, very high TFRs um, are probably poorer areas, less education, um, more disease, more in higher infant mortality rates. Um, this map specifically with lower rates um, are going to be the darker green areas. So keep in mind North America, um, Europe, Australia, Japan, um, but it's important to also understand the areas of the high. So Africa, Sub-Saharan Africa is going to have the highest rate of total fertility rate. They also have the highest infant mortality rate as well. Um, India and China, again, India is quickly approaching the highest populated country in the world. They have tried to do certain things to limit population growth. Again, there is sort of a uh, both in China and India, there is a preference for male children because your male offspring take care of you when you get older. Your female offspring take care of their husband's family when they get older. So there's a preference for males, and that has increased population numbers in India. They've tried to do some things um, in the past that haven't and haven't really worked very well. So in the 70s, there was a forced sterilization plan, which um, many people, mostly poor people, were, were taken by truck out to camps and forced to be sterilized. That started riots, so that didn't work too well. Um, there's also been, like, you can get a gun license if you prove, prove you've been sterilized. That caused some problems where landowners would have their, their um, servants and workers get sterilized. They didn't have to, but yet they get the gun license. So really, the best thing that they're doing today is just to have family planning, having free available birth control to try and convince people not to have as many children. It will start happening as women are getting more and more educated and getting better paying jobs. But for the time being, India still has a very high population. Um, we'll talk about China's policy a, a little bit later. Um, 
one of the other things you need to make sure you know for this chapter is the demographic transition model. I always talk about it as the DTM. And this started in Great Britain. It was using church data to look at baptisms and funeral funerals to find birth rates and death rates. And there's a, a list of stages that countries go through within the DTM. So again, you, it's really related to birth rates and death rates. And these maps, you can, you can kind of pause the video and look at a little bit further. This is the different stages of the DTM. So um, you should understand what the different lines mean. You've got um, the blue line is going to be your, your death rate. I'm sorry, your birth rate, excuse me. The, the um, line B is your birth rate. Um, a is actually your actual growth for your, from year to year um, or from month to month. So stage one is called low growth. This is because you have a very high birth rate and a very high death rate. Both are high, which means that over the course of the year, there are lots of babies that are born, but there's also lots of babies and other people that die because of disease, um, unsanitary conditions, all sorts of things. That's low growth. Stage two is high growth. This is where you first thing that happens is the death rate goes down, which means that you have all the same amount of babies that are being born as they were in stage one, but now not as many of them are dying and not as many other people are dying. So that means that from January to December, within a year, you have high growth in your population. Stage three is when your birth rate starts to decline a little bit. So your death rate is continuing to decline and now the birth rate's going down. So it's not high growth anymore, it's still moderate growth. You still have more births than deaths, but not as many as you used to have. So uh, for example, a TFR in a stage two country might be something like five or six per, um, babies per woman. In stage three, we're talking three or four. They've come down somewhat. Stage four is called low growth or stationary growth. It's different than the low growth of stage one, though. This is the ideal stage. This is where your birth rate has continued to come down to where you almost have two babies, which is the ideal replacement level, for per woman. And so you have um, just as many babies being born as people die, so the population just stays the same. It's stationary growth. Um, stage five is declining population. This is actually not a great thing. This is where you have less babies being born than, the pe than people are dying. So you might have a negative um, rate of natural increase, which means that ultimately what happens is as those babies grow up, they are not working. They're in the working class population. They are not enough people in the working class population to support all the elderly people. And that's called an elderly dependency ratio. In stage two, you would have that high growth. That means you probably have a high um, child dependency ratio. There are lots and lots of percent of population that are 14 and under, so the working class has to support them and there's not enough working class for that. Um, we also need to look at population pyramids. You need to be able to understand what they are, what they look like, what they're saying, be able to analyze them. Um, so again, poorer countries tend to look very pretty in their pyramid, but that doesn't mean that it's a good place to live. It means they're probably going to have a high birth rate, high death rate, um, lots of un, you know uneducated women. Um, the uglier the pyramid, the, the uh, more developed the country is. So more of a rectangular base, or even in our stage five countries, you're going to have that inverted pyramid. Um, again, in stages in countries that have a very pretty population pyramid, they're going to have a high infant mortality rate. They're also going to have probably a very low life expectancy. So again, I want you to be able to understand what these statistics mean in terms of what that will mean for not only their population pyramid, but the stage of the DTM. Um, AIDS has certainly affected countries and their population pyramids. Um, it, it's, it's called that it looks like a chimney because essentially it's just a cut off at the top. There's very few people that live above a certain age. So um, because AIDS is, is so prevalent within the population. These are some population pyramids of countries that have done a little bit, you know, a little bit better off. So again, it's not a pretty pyramid, but you will, um, you will probably like living there a little better. They would have, again, a very low TFR, lower birth rate, um, low infant mortality rate, high literacy rate. Um, so just kind of think about those populations. Um, again, I said about the high elder dependency ratio with countries like Japan and, and in countries in Europe. And we talked about the Europe baby bust quite a bit, so think about that. Um, the other thing that countries are trying to do is to then um, deal with chronic diseases, 